you so much to everyone for um, organizing our symposium today, um, as well as to Sarah Haley. Um, I uh, am pulling the bulk of my talk today from a dissertation. Uh, I'm a doctoral candidate in women's studies at the University of Michigan, and I'm working on a dissertation that uh, examines contemporary life writing by black trans women and argues that imagination can be used as a multi-modal form of um, resistance in terms of its narrative capacities and its um, ability to transgress social inequalities. Um, and specifically today, I'd like to put um, two young black women in conversation, uh, Cece McDonald and Angela Davis, at least in her in 1974. <laughs> Sharing our stories continues to be a central facet of human experience. Texts and repositories of those stories, therefore, constitute key sites of political struggle and transformation. Here, I'm interested in the connections between the political life writing authored by political prisoner and academic Angela Y. Davis and Cece McDonald, a young black trans woman who suffered some of the worst tenets of the prison industrial complex because she dared to defend herself from a racist and transphobic attack in 2011 in Minneapolis. Beyond the bridge these two women construct on their own, one of the intellectual linkages between black feminist thought and trans feminism is the development of a political analysis based on material experiences of systems of harm designed to become invisible due to their normalcy and frequency. As trans study scholar Susan Stryker and Paisley Curra affirmed, trans people can articulate critical knowledge from embodied positions that would otherwise be rendered pathological, marginal, invisible, or unintelligible within dominant and normative organizations of power and knowledge. The letters McDonald wrote and circulated during her incarceration between 2011 and 2014 convey her own consciousness raising by highlighting how the contradictions she observed since childhood inform larger power structures that govern our realities today. In her letter titled, Violence Against Trans Women Today, she queries, how can society say that it detests and challenges violence against women when there is very little, if any, real help for us and the help we give ourselves results in punishment? End quote. The contradictory position McDonald attacks here is one that maintains that violence against women is wrong and should be challenged unless women dare to defend themselves from violence. This begs the question, what is it about women's self-defense that is so offensive to such social orders that profess to value women's safety? Though she offers no clear answer, McDonald helps moves us closer to an answer by emphasizing both her own right to defense and the ways in which women are connected through criminalized self-defense. The letter begins by defining the issue of violence against all women as a global one, quote, a major problem in the entire world, and a dilemma that plagues all women, which of course includes trans women, end quote. By noting that violence happens to all women on all scales of society, from, quote, harsh rule over a nation or domestic rule inside the household, off to all forms of street violence, McDonald reinforces the position that trans women are included in the category of women, and she illuminates how universal and commonplace violence against women actually is. She specifies that trans women statistically experience higher volumes of violence than cis women, numbers that only worsen when racial bias and anti-blackness are also considered as factors to such violence. She encourages her reader to understand that, quote, everything that a cissexual person can do with ease are a constant risk for trans women of color, end quote, such as using public transportation, going to the grocery store, or even walking with friends down the street. McDonald explains, if I never learned to assert myself, I would have never gained the courage to defend myself against those who have not res respect or gratitude towards the others in the world. By extending her own courage to her community and advocating for this deep self-actualization through self-defense, McDonald begins to construct what Bell Hooks names a liberatory paradigm of black subjectivity one that moves beyond resistance and oppositional worldviews and toward more radical and liberatory modes of knowledge. Indeed, Hooks would label visions such as McDonald as a successful deployment of critical imagination, um, Hooks' own term. Identifying contradictions is a critical first step in McDonald's political development, 
one that then allows her to deploy a politics of interruption in her political life writing, which exemplifies how imaginative counter-narratives produce new modes of thinking around trans women of color's relationship to violence and freedom. If we consider McDonald's political life writing then as contributing to the literary and political traditions passed down from the fugitive slave narrative, as we've already talked a little bit about this morning, mm -hmm. then we see how her writing deploys a politics of interruption that moves past dominant ideologies toward more liberatory possibilities. In recalling her difficult life experiences, coupled with self-mediated political education, which included reading the autobiographies of Asada Shakur and Hugh P. Newton, reading Angela Davis's Art Prisons Obsolete, and the then first edition of Captive Genders, edited by Eric Stanley and Nat Smith. McDonald mobilizes black trans feminist analysis to shed light on something I call regimes of unprotection, something that I formulate alongside, oh, excuse me, Something I formulate alongside Sarah Haley's term of gender, quote, gender in the Jim Crow South as a gender ideology constructed and reiterated through discourses of protection, meaning that the category of gender is maintained by understanding white women as a protected class of subjects and therefore the proper inhabitants of female gender. If the proper inhabitants of gender are considered a protected class, then those who continue to experience lack of protection or defense in the social schema must therefore be unconsidered. And we name this a regime because of the overwhelming um, totality of that unprotectedness. Given the sociopolitical reality, regimes of unprotection is a biopolitical naming of how dominant structures of power purposefully construct certain populations of subjects as legally inviolable, yet vulnerable to persistent violation and discrimination. In other words, groups negatively impacted by dominant gender, racial, sexual ideologies, such as trans women of color, are contradictorily unprotected by the law. By this, I don't mean to simply state that trans women of color and other oppressed groups are left out of legal protections. Rather, I intend to draw attention to the specific ways in which trans women of color are purposefully not protected by the law when they exert some form of self-determination, such as the determination to live. Regimes of unprotection then rely on the vulnerability and indefensibility of marginalized subjects and communities to construct an arena of precarity for those populations. McDonald demonstrates her abolitionist politic by highlighting the connection between former and current forms, current and firmer forms of captivity, stating, quote, like slavery, there is no way around the violence of the PIC. Furthermore, she asserts, quote, Millions of other people also get caught up in this system that evolved from the slave trade and is still maintained through racism, imperialism, patriarchy, and every other form of hierarchy." End quote. McDonald's exploration of this historical relationship evidences how dominant institutions continue to produce regimes of unprotection, unprotection well, that too. <laughs> through, through oppressive gender, racial, sexual ideologies. Here, here, Angela Davis reminds us in the preface to her autobiography, only by taking ser history seriously could these immensely important insights have eventually become accessible to us. This recognition also means that our work to imagine possible futures will give rise to new insights that will render some of our current ideas and vocabularies obsolete." End quote. McDonald's childhood experiences with abuse and assault and harassment, her treatment by the police despite seeking aid for her urgent medical needs, and the inadmissibility of the uh, neo-Nazi who attacked her um, Nazi tattoo on his body, um, and how that was an inadmissible piece of evidence, during her trial all, I think, fall under this regime of unprotection. One calculated ways in which she was left vulnerable to violence because of racialized gender bias. Ruth Wilson Gilmore claims that there are many different kinds of abolition, not one monolithic political vision or praxis. Having consulted books such as This Bridge Called My Back, Radical Writing, Writing by Radical Women of Color, and Our Prisons Obsolete by Angela Davis, McDonald formulates a narrative of prison abolition that stresses the centrality of imagining a world without prison. And she's doing this while being solitarily confined within such a prison. She names this approach imaginative abolition, emphasizing imagination centrality to prison abolition. 
which I argue is perhaps the most difficult and queerest aspect of prison abolition, the most elusive and possibly most full of potential. And McDonald's framework of imaginative abolition demands that we dream of different ways of being in the world, namely a world without prisons, punitive or carceral logics, or ways of addressing social need that result in people being locked in cages. This perspective is situated along a tradition of black feminists attempting to recuperate the image of black women via modes of self-representation that highlight the agency that black women have and always have, despite pressures of society. By centering her experiences and those of trans women of color and women punished for self-defense, McDonald shifts the epistemic relationship between trans women of color and violence, opening up other relational possibilities. As a fashion student, McDonald embraces art and beauty as modes of expression. Her imaginative declaration, which is in captive genders, when she says, quote, you can be cute, wear talons, and be an abolitionist, all register her affective relationship with beauty and femininity and feminists as inseparable from her political relationship with prison abolition. Her own relationship to abolition exemplifies her belief that, quote, we have to make prison abolition inviting so people can see it from their own perspective, end quote. As well as her didactic approach to building community and black trans leadership through her own life lessons. Here we see her demonstrating Davis's premise that she writes in her autobiography of, quote, the sense of connectedness to larger revolutionary struggles also generates the kind of collective passion that could only thrive in such a context, end quote. And both women wrote those lines while being in prison, so I find something really um, particularly illuminating and strong with that. In the preface to her uh, original 1974 autobiography, Angela Davis thanks Toni Morrison for helping her conceive of the book as not her own individual life story, but rather as a political autobiography, or, quote, such a book that might serve a very important and practical purpose. There was and is the possibility that, having read it, more people would understand why so many of us have no alternative but to offer our lives, our bodies, our knowledge, our will to the cause of our oppressed people. End quote. Expanding the term from political autobiography to political life writing to include more various types of cultural objects, such as memoir, personal letters, documentary, and online life writing. The political writing of Cece McDonald are central artifacts in the corpus of black trans women's life writing and radical women's writing more broadly. Additionally, McDonald expands our political consciousness by demonstrating how a radical black trans feminist perspective can illuminate hidden structures of power and imaginative work towards other possible forms of freedom and world making. Similar to the other texts under examination in my dissertation, which I guess you'll have to read just know what that is. Um, <laughs> McDonald's political life writing aims to enhance the livability uh, of black trans women and trans women of color by theorizing alternative epistemological angles from which to creatively deepen one's self-awareness and value despite regimes of unprotection, discourses of protection, and other biopolitical forms of management, capture, and disposability. McDonald interrupts the intended function of the prison and of these regimes by writing about her black trans femme life in expansive and colorful ways, and making sure those stories made it out of the prison and into the hands of her comrades. She creates images, draws on literary and political traditions, such as Val books, um, Maya Angelou, and the Davis, and develops useful concepts and frameworks while surviving and working toward liberation, hers and others, in her life writing. Emphasizing the creative power life writing has for helping trans women of color envision and actualize freedom. This creative power then transforms her political life writing from a collection of prison letters and a foreword to a record of hope for girls like her. Um, 